want him alive. You're cool. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. And today, we'll be exploring the 2008 sci-fi action thriller Doomsday, which was directed by the talented Neil Marshall, starring Rona Mitra, Bob Hoskins, Adrian Lester, Alexander Siddiq, and his legendary uncle, Malcolm McDowell. The film essentially shows the outbreak and spread of the fictitious Reaper virus in Scotland, and the subsequent breakdown of society that follows it. Taking cues from Mad Max, Escape from New York, Waterworld, and Gladiator, Doomsday is a homage to the post-apocalyptic films of the 1970s and 80s, with Marshall explaining that he wanted younger audiences to experience the same thrill he had when watching those classics on the big screen. Having grown up near the ruins of Hadrian's Wall, which is a Roman fortification built in 122 AD to defend England against Scottish tribes, the director had fantasized about what conditions could potentially cause for the wall to be rebuilt and started developing a story that revolved around a lethal virus. Still stretching to a distance of 118 kilometers, the largest Roman archaeological site still standing also inspired his fusion of medieval and futuristic elements, and the writer-director began playing with the idea that those on one side of the wall had continued their medieval ways, while those on the other side, and presumably the rest of the world, had continued developing. And he was quoted saying, I had this vision of these futuristic soldiers with high-tech weaponry and body armor and helmets that were clearly from the future, facing a medieval knight on horseback. With this image ingrained into his vision of the film, the director began formulating a story that would facilitate it. I also think that it's important to note that while Hadrian's Wall was the inspiration and seed behind the creation of Doomsday, he'd actually thought about setting the futuristic wall on the boundary of Canada and the United States before favoring the English-Scottish border. This decision ultimately stemmed from the rich history behind Hadrian's Wall and the already tumultuous love-hate relationship Scotland had with the UK and its place within it. This ended up being a great choice and the film sort of became a political allegory that foreshadowed the Scottish referendum that occurred six years later. Additionally, Scotland is the home to multiple castles and picturesque locations, which also perfectly fit Marshall's medieval concept. After completing a rough draft of the script in 2004 and sending it over to Rogue Pictures, Marshall was then signed on to direct the picture the following year. Rona Mitra was the first person to be cast in the film as Major Eden Sinclair, the protagonist and leader of an elite team that was sent into the chaos to find a cure, and her character was heavily inspired by the legendary Snake Plissken, featured in John Carpenter's Escape from New York. Find the president, bring him out in 24 hours, and you're a free man. What if I'm a little late? And no more Snake Plissken. When I get back, I'm gonna kill you. The rest of the actors, including Malcolm McDowell, Bob Hoskins, Adrian Lester, and Alexander Siddiq, were then cast within the next few months, roughly a year before the film was to be shot. Doomsday had an estimated budget of 22 million, which at that point was triple the combined total of Marshall's two previous films, Dog Soldiers and The Descent, which I still think is his best feature film to date. The director even admitted that this significant increase in production scale was a challenge as he'd only been accustomed to small casts and limited locations. Production for Doomsday began on February of 2007 in South Africa, where the majority of filming took place, as shooting in South Africa cost them a third of what they would have had to fork out if they filmed Doomsday in the UK. The director also pointed out that the landscape and rock formations located there were as close to Scotland that they would find outside of the UK. Secondary filming took place in the city of Glasgow, including Hag Hill in the city's East End and at Blackness Castle in West Lothian. The entire shoot involved thousands of extras and included a series of complex fight scenes and pyrotechnical displays, in part due to the director's insistence that they should minimize the use of CGI. So dedicated were they to this principle that the production team ended up dropping several action sequences that risked pushing Doomsday over its budget, including an epic scene where a helicopter gunship attacked a medieval castle. Now, the film opens to reveal that a viral outbreak of the fictional Reaper virus had occurred in Glasgow on April the 3rd, 2008, with no identified cause. Though I should point out that it's hinted by both the narrator at the start and one of the Prime Minister's officials that the virus was nature's way of creating balance in a world that was overpopulated and unstable. In the film, it's explained that the Reaper virus killed hundreds of innocent people within days, and eventually thousands by the end of the first week by causing internal hemorrhaging, similar to the effects caused by the vicious Ebola virus. Unable to contain the outbreak or cure the infected, the British government built a massive wall on top of the ruins of Hadrian's Wall, with the intention of isolating Scotland from the rest of Great Britain. In addition to the wall, all major transport routes including air travel, ocean travel, and roads were all closed while Scotland was placed under quarantine. Our protagonist Eden is only a child during the outbreak, and during the attempted exodus, she's accidentally shot in the eye by the military. A soldier then sacrifices his place on the last helicopter leaving Scotland, allowing the girl to make it to safety. 
Although the quarantine was deemed a success, the extreme method employed by the government destroyed diplomatic and economic relations between the UK and the rest of the world. Almost three decades later and now working as a cop, Eden Sinclair and her team crack down on a people smuggling ring and inadvertently find the first infected cases within the UK. With the outbreak soon to take over London, a crisis session is held where the leaders decide to implement the same strategies that were used in Glasgow years prior. It's also revealed that while there was a strict no-fly zone over Scotland, there were surveillance drones that flew over the infected areas on a daily basis since the outbreak. And while the first 27 years showed nothing but death and decay, the last three years of footage showed that there were survivors that had miraculously survived the Reaper virus. Desperate for answers and ultimately a cure, Eden's chief asks her to head back to Scotland in search of a Dr. Kane who was a medical researcher that had been searching for a cure when Scotland was initially quarantined. Nothing could prepare her team for what they are about to encounter. Fueled by decades of pain, poverty and neglect, the civilization that awaits them had been split into two by a father and son at war. Now, the city is run by Sol, Kane's son, who was a wild, ultra-violent tyrant that used modern weapons and ambush tactics to wipe out all opposition to him, and his people showed no mercy, even going so far as to kill and eat a few members of Eden's squad in the most savage way. It's also explained that Sol had planned on using Eden as leverage to cross the wall to begin an invasion of England as revenge for what had happened to Scotland. Though her team are captured by Sol and his cannibals, Eden and a handful of her men are able to escape with the help of another prisoner named Callie, who is revealed to be Sol's sister and Kane's other child. After a brief struggle, Eden and her team finally make it to the country and find Kane, played by the legendary Malcolm McDowell, who runs it like his medieval forefathers. I really admired the clash between the father and son, as it was a literal and metaphorical representation of the age-old struggle between the old world and the new world, which was the very image that catapulted Marshall to make the film. After being taken into his medieval castle and imprisoned, Marcus Kane finally reveals the truth to Eden in that there was no cure, only people with a natural immunity to the Reaper virus. Originally a medical researcher, Kane was devastated when his family was left behind during the quarantine and after losing his wife and succumbing to rage, the man became a ruthless and unsympathetic leader. These walls around you, they were built to last and so shall we. What we've built here from the ashes is pure blood uninfected by the outside world. We have earned the right to live here, purged of the likes of you. Severely underestimating the grit and badassery of Eden Sinclair, Kane sentences her team to death and pits her against his executioner in a fight to the death. However, what Kane failed to realize was that Eden was not afraid of conflict and actually reveled in it, and the greater the opponent, the more fun she seemed to have. Though she was relatively out of place in London, having to tone down her inner brutality, here Eden was able to be herself and we see her utilizing her wits, resourcefulness and unrestrained savagery to defeat the executioner, while her team broke out of prison once again. Now, Sinclair, Callie and her two remaining team members Norton and Sterling manage to escape to a fallout shelter entrance on horseback, where they find an intact 2007 Bentley Continental GT, while being closely pursued by Kane's medieval knights who eventually take Norton out. The group then drive away only to find themselves being intercepted by Sol's gang in an epic high-speed chase reminiscent of Mad Max, in which Sol and many of his men are killed. Unfortunately for the group, the car is eventually stopped by a government helicopter led by Canaris, who had essentially staged a coup of the failing government. Although Eden tells him that there was no cure, Canaris reveals that he planned on letting the virus continue as a means of population control, and also explains that he was going to use Kali's blood to formulate a vaccine for the virus that he would then use for his own profit. Her chief also flies into the quarantine zone shortly after, where she hands him a recording of a conversation with Canaris to be used to bring the self-instated leader of the UK down. The reason that Eden decides to stay is that not only was Scotland her original home, but this new world also allowed her to be herself. This is perfectly encapsulated with the final shot of the film where Eden retrieves the head of Sol and displays it to his gang, effectively taking his place as their leader. <laughs> it's amazing, you teach somebody something and it's like, well this is the quickest response. As mentioned earlier, many of the action sequences for Doomsday were based around the 1980s stunt sequences for films like Mad Max and Escape from New York, involving over 275 visual effects shots in total. As the crew were working with budget restrictions, the production team secured a lot of their shots by using set extensions that utilized paintings and 3D solutions. The most challenging visual effects shot in Doomsday was actually the close-up in which Sean Pertwee's character was burnt alive, with the shot requiring multiple enhancements and implementations of burning wardrobes, burning pigskin and smoke and fire elements to look authentic. For the insane chase sequence at the end of the movie, the filmmakers purchased three new Bentley Continental GTs for 150,000 US each. 
The scene in which the Bentley crashes through a bus was intended to implement pyrotechnics, but fire marshals forbade the use of live fire due to the dry conditions that had the potential to start bushfires in South Africa. Though they ended up shooting the sequence which included the car driving through the bus, all the fire visual effects were added in post. Surprisingly, two out of the three Bentleys were able to make it out of the punishing stunt work, needing only a handful of repairs and cosmetic adjustments, which meant that they were able to sell the cars at the end of the shoot and recuperate some of their losses. I really enjoyed this film, and though Doomsday struggled to make its mark at the box office, it's a well-paced and fantastically executed homage to post-apocalyptic films of the late 70s and 80s. The film has a solid story, is well cast, and it doesn't take itself too seriously, with even Marshall acknowledging that his creation was going to divide audiences, before stating that he just wanted his viewers to be thrilled and overwhelmed by the imagery that they see, something that even the harshest of critics agreed he'd managed to achieve, with most stating that while they had issues here and there with Doomsday, there was never a dull moment in the film. Well, that's all for today, folks. Big thanks to all of you guys who requested we explore Doomsday. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.